Hi. Good afternoon. Now I would like to introduce Professor Brian Wilson from the University of Toronto for our last lecture. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Uh, thank you to everyone for uh, staying until the last session. Let's see if I use this. So the, uh, the title that was uh, in the, uh, the book was actually um, PDT Engineering or something like that. Uh, but I realized as the uh, <coughs> week has progressed here that a lot of the things that I might have covered uh, under that have already been covered. So I'm actually, I've actually changed the title uh, and I'm going to talk about uh, optical uh, technology for PDT and for interventional guidance. And, um, I, I will talk a little about technology advances in PDT, but, but not in great detail, just to give a little overview. Uh, I mainly want to talk about optical guidance for the more general concept of therapeutic interventions, and you'll see that there is some um, linkage with uh, some of the talks, uh, particularly uh, Br Bruce's talk this morning. Uh, but I thought I'd start by just stepping back uh, from this whole area of uh, PDT, <coughs> which after all is a light-based treatment, uh, and uh, uh, just give you some ideas about technology transfer into light-based treatments in a more general sense. So let me start with this first thing. As I showed you uh, in the nanotechnology talk, uh, all of uh, what we do with light, light um, uh, optical therapeutics is based on advances in, in uh, photonics, the basic sciences, and when you combine uh, those photonic sciences with these other sciences, sciences it drives biophotonics into therapeutic diagnostics and analytics and biotechnology. So just to talk about optical therapeutics in this uh, particular session, uh, this is just a collage showing various uh, therapeutic uses of light in medicine. And I want to make the point that uh, whether you're doing PDT or any other treatment using light, essentially you're using light to, to alter the presence or the structure and or the function of cells, tissues, biomaterials in a living patient. So that's what we really mean by phototherapeutics. And it's uh, useful to just look at the history of that. I won't go through in any detail, uh, but this field really started, well, it actually started with the ancient Egyptians. Uh, uh, the, 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 uh, the Egyptians' uh, uh, god Ra uh, was a god of the sun, and that was because the sun was venerated as a god because it was recognized and the ancient Egyptians actually used uh, sunlight therapeutically. Uh, but in the modern era, uh, the uh, start of uh, phototherapeutics was really in the clinic of Niels Finsen, uh, who was a dermatologist in Copenhagen, and uh, in fact, one of the very first Nobel Prizes in medicine was for phototherapeutics, <coughs> where Finsen used light uh, to treat diseases, and particularly lupus, uh, vulgaris, uh, which is a benign condition of the skin with what he called concentrated light radiation and has opened a new avenue for medical science. And if you look at the literature on this, this is a picture of Finson's clinic in Copenhagen uh, where he used the sunlight and uh, this is to treat skin diseases and you'll recognize that there are two problems with this therapeutic uh, approach. One is that this is in Copenhagen and uh, there's not a lot of sun in Copenhagen. Uh, and the second is, of course, this, this was in 1895, and so uh, uh, respectable people did not take their clothes off in public, and so how do you treat skin diseases without taking your clothes off? <laughs> so Finson recognized that this was a technological limitation, and so he looked to uh, the available technology at that time and the technology that he found was this. Now, just to give you an idea of scale, because it's difficult to see what this is, there is a lady sitting here. This is, she's wearing a long dress. So this is her knee, and this is her arm. So this is the light source. Uh, this is a carbon arc lamp from a lighthouse. And so Finson used this original optical technology for phototherapeutics. And it was successful enough that he received a Nobel Prize in medicine. Uh, this is not a viable technology. Mm -hmm. It's possible to do research 
with such a technology. This cannot be disseminated into the clinic. And so, in fact, this field really uh, died uh, to a large extent until the discovery and the invention of the laser, uh, which was invented in 1960 by uh, Ted Naiman, although he did not get the Nobel Prize for the laser. Uh, he received the Japanese equivalent of the Nobel Prize in engineering, uh, but the Nobel Prize for the invention of the laser went to uh, uh, theoreticians. But Ted Maiman was the first to actually make a laser work. And I went to the 50th anniversary uh, of the invention of the laser uh, in, in 2010 uh, at, uh, in Vancouver. And they took the original laser uh, that Maiman had built, and it was in a wooden box, and it had not been switched on for 50 years. And in the middle of an audience like this, they took the laser out, plugged it in, and it worked, which is amazing. So 50 years later, this laser still worked. It went very quickly into medical practice. So this is Leon Goldman, who was one of the pioneers in laser medicine, using a ruby laser. Uh, within uh, 12 months of its actual invention. And now, of course, uh, lasers uh, spread uh, in very ma many areas of medicine. Uh, I've just listed some of them here. Coupled with optical fibers, it makes it very convenient to deliver the light. And really what you get from the use of light is precision, minimally invasive, and the possibility of selectivity. Now, if you look at those aspects of uh, precision and selectivity, there are two um, uh, parameters that you need to understand that, that actually determine this. The first is the wavelength, because the wavelength determines two things. First of all, the molecules that absorb the energy. So if you want to, for example, close down blood vessels, then you have to use a wavelength that is absorbed by hemoglobin. And there's no point in using a wavelength that is uh, very far from the absorption bands. And secondly, it determines, as you know because of all the discussion this week, it determines the, the depth into which the energy is deposited. And this is just shown graphically here. This is the spectrum of tissue components, the hemoglobin and water that we've seen already, uh, but this time on a logarithmic scale. And this just shows the, the one upon E penetration depth of uh, light at different wavelengths. These correspond to specific laser wavelengths. And you see that it varies from uh, of the order of several millimeters uh, to, to a fraction of a millimeter. <coughs> and so this very much determines the type of treatments that can be given. For example, if you use a CO2 laser at, at uh, 10 microns, this is very, very heavily absorbed, absorbed by water. Uh, and the depth of penetration, the one upon E is about 10 microns. And so water is a primary absorber, and so you can do, with this type of penetration, you can remove tissue with great precision in any hydrated tissue. And for example, this is used as a general surgical tool, it's used in skin remodeling, and at least at one time it was used for myocardial reperfusion, where if a patient had a heart attack and you had an area of uh, reduced vascularity uh, and reduced oxygen in the heart muscle, you could punch holes in the heart and that would stimulate angiogenesis and the heart would recover. And one of the convenient ways to punch a hole was to put a hole through the chest wall and take a CO2 laser and just punch holes into the heart. And that, that treatment was quite successful. At the other end of the scale, if you come down a factor of 10, and this is just coincidence that this is exactly a factor of 10, the one over E penetration is more like millimeters. The blood is a primary absorber. And there you can do bulk tissue and blood coagulation. So it's hemostatic. So if you were a surgeon like Colin and you tried to cut through a very vascularized lesion with a CO2 laser, you would have blood spouting. Uh, however, if you use a neodymium YAG laser, because it's absorbed by the blood, you actually coagulate the blood as you cut. And so you can do deep cutting uh, is used, for example, in dentistry. This is a patient with a, an obstructing uh, uh, tumor in the esophagus. Uh, go down with an optical fiber in an endoscope and essentially uh, 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 cut your way through that, burn your way through that with this laser, and you open up the, 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 uh, the, uh, the uh, tube. So wavelength is very critical. And the second thing that's very critical is the optical pulse length. <coughs> this is a complicated slide, so let me just walk you through it. This is the uh, power density in watts per square centimeter on a logarithmic scale. You notice it goes from 10 to the minus 3 to 10 to the 12. So there are 15 orders of magnitude of intensity here. The sun 
uh, uh, if you go out in the, uh, near the, at the equator at noon, uh, then you have about this level of exposure. So when we treat up here, we're treating with a billion times the power, the intensity of the sun on the Earth. On this axis is the exposure of the pulse length going from, say, 10 to the 3 min uh, seconds, that's 20 minutes, down to less than nanoseconds. Now, if you plot power versus, versus time, the diagonal is energy. And so this is the line of equal energy density. And interestingly enough, as you go up in power and down in exposure at roughly the same energy within an order or two orders of magnitude, you uh, hit different regions of light tissue interaction, so at very low level, uh, very low intensity for long times, you get photomodulation, such as this soft laser treatment, which involves uh, the triggering of uh, um, natural uh, biochemical pathways in the cells, <coughs> such as the met metabolism. If you go to slightly higher level, you get photochemistry, which is the whole basis of PDT. Uh, as shown here, I show you that I showed you that slide uh, two days ago. If you go to the point of higher energy, maybe around about a, uh, a hundred of, of uh, uh, watts per square centimeter, you start to get thermal. The energy is converted to heat. This is an example of uh, coagulation of port wine stain using a laser of this sort of pulse length and this sort of pulse energy, um, and that the wavelength is absorbed by blood, and you get selective shutdown of the blood vessels, so you get this very nice healing response without scarring. You carry on up here, you start to directly break molecular bonds, so the light, the photon is absorbed and directly breaks molecular bonds, and that's used for, uh, uh, for uh, uh, reshaping uh, the cornea. So if you have corneal reshaping, uh, you get micro explosions uh, on, on your cornea, taking off about a micron of tissue at a time. Uh, and if you carry on to uh, very, very high uh, uh, power densities, you start to get the, uh, into the region where you have multi-photon absorption, and the light can actually cause ionization. So although each photon has only a very low energy, the photons come in so rapidly that they can ionize, they can raise the energy level of the molecule to the point of ionization. You produce a plasma, the plasma collapses, that's a plasma of ionized gas. The plasma collapses. It causes a shock wave, and the shock wave uh, ruptures the tissue. And this is used, for example, for uh, uh, laser breaking of kidney stones. So you can uh, break up these, these kidney stones uh, by a, a catheter put up into the kidneys, uh, and now you break it up into small enough fragments that they can be passed in the urine. So I just wanted to make the point that this whole area of laser phototherapeutics or phototherapeutics um, depends on understanding the biophysics of the light tissue interactions in some detail. For example, in Port Weinstein, uh, it was uh, developed first for adult use, and then it was decided to try it in uh, children or in babies, because then you uh, treat the condition at the earliest possible stage. And the first few treatments were a disaster because the tissue optics of uh, young people's skin is completely different. If you look at a newborn baby, they're almost transparent. Right? So the optics is different. And so in order to make it successful in a baby, they had to shift the wavelength by two nanometers. Right? That was enough to go from disaster to complete success. So, and that understanding of how to go from disaster to success was by physicists, biophysicists in the lab doing experiments and finding out, ah, okay, if we have that tissue optics, we have to move the wavelength. So there's a lot of very, very uh, <coughs> uh, rigorous uh, um, biophysical studies have gone into optimizing this whole range of treatments. So how about switching now to PDT, the photochemistry? You've heard throughout this meeting lots of technology advances in photosensitizers, targeting, modulating the biological response. I want to just here very quickly summarize some of the aspects of instrumentation in both hardware and software. And so if we look at these in terms of sources, delivery systems and devices, treatment planning, dosimetry, and response monitoring, this 
by itself could be a whole course. I'll just give you some very um, uh, quick overview. So we've heard about light, different light sources, different light delivery systems, and these are examples shown here, uh, where you select the light source and the delivery system uh, to be optimum for the particular uh, uh, treatment. And it can be interstitial or endoscopic or intraoperative, as well as just uh, uh, superficial. Uh, there are emerging technologies. Uh, we heard about LEDs. Uh, you can make LED arrays that can be uh, uh, placed interstitially. Uh, we heard about optical, LED, uh, oh sorry, organic LED patches, uh, which are low intensity, but, and so the PDT is given over a very long time of hours or even days, and the patient can actually wear uh, a bit like this, mi or the microphone uh, uh, power pack, uh, and, and then the patch is just placed on, in this case, on the arm, and the patient wears it in normal life. And here's an example uh, from the group in the Netherlands uh, where they developed a particular uh, light applicator for a particular uh, 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 clinical application, which was for nasopharyngeal uh, cancer. And that technology went into very successful clinical trials, for example, in Indonesia, where there are, uh, where this is a very common uh, 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 form of cancer. Uh, but if you had tried to do this uh, using uh, just to say a straight fiber, this would be extremely difficult because it's a complex curved shape. So they developed this particular de light delivery to match the particular tumor. So that's an important emerging area uh, <coughs> where rather than using a generic technology, uh, we develop technology that's specific to the particular disease and even the particular patient. Uh, an example of treatment planning and dissymmetry, Tim told you a lot this morning about PDT for prostate cancer. Now, if you're treating just a simple uh, two centimeter tumor on the skin, such as is being done in Brazil, you don't need a lot of treatment planning and dissymmetry. You just need to know how much light you're giving. But if you're treating the prostate, for example, which is a deep-seated organ uh, of uh, non-uniform shape uh, that is adjacent to very critical normal tissues, then you cannot just do this in a simple way. If it's going to be done successfully, PDT has to be done properly in these conditions. You cannot translate the simple, well, I can treat a skin tumor just by shining a light. It doesn't work to say, well, I can treat a prostate tumor just by shining a light. You have to develop a whole technology platform that has to work completely as an integrated system, and that takes a lot of work. So it involves development of technologies. This just shows the technology that we developed, a multi-channel dissymmetry system. Tim uh, described a similar technique, and uh, University of Lund has described a similar technique. When we did the first patient with this technique, we had 22 people in the room. Now that got reduced over time, but there was that to get this all to come together we needed 22 people for the first patient. Now hopefully you get it down to maybe just using uh, uh, the, the, the normal operating staff plus maybe one additional technical person. Uh, it was essential to do treatment planning. It's a complex shape with adjacent critical structures. You have to approach this in the same way as you approach radiation treatment. In radiation treatment, they've had 100 years of development of complex and sophisticated treatment planning and delivery. If you're going to do PDT for these difficult organs uh, that are in complex uh, uh, critical uh, 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 locations, you have to do this sort of procedure. You cannot do this just by sticking the fibers in and hoping. And as Katrina described, uh, there are now developing, uh, evolving uh, complete packages. This is actually an older version than the one she showed, uh, but uh, uh, complete technology solutions uh, where the light, uh, uh, there's a unit that generates the light, you distribute the light through a module, and you have a diagnostic unit uh, where you measure the light, the oxygen, the photosensitizer, etc. And so if, when you look at PDT, you have to <coughs> realize that there is not a single technical solution that will work for every type of disease or cancer that you want to treat. Uh, you have to uh, have very simple solutions for some situations to really quite complex and sophisticated solutions to others. Uh, in terms of treatment response monitoring, uh, there's lots of examples. In fact, Colin showed us this morning uh, some nice examples of MRI and, and ultrasound and OCT. Uh, I'll just list for you that uh, there are a, um, 
in the area of optical monitoring, either spectroscopic or imaging, uh, things like laser Doppler has been used, fluorescence, Raman, OCT, et cetera. So if we just take the example of OCT, uh, this was a, uh, an interstitial OCT uh, device that we developed a number of years ago. Uh, this is not a device that you want to try to take on your hand luggage at the airport. Uh, so you have to put it in your checked baggage, as we found out. Uh, and here we are, here we are uh, using this to try to monitor. This, this particular OCT system is a Doppler OCT system, and so it's designed in the same way as Do Doppler ultrasound to measure uh, blood flow. We're not so interested here in the structure. Colin this, this morning showed us in the head and neck some, uh, uh, or what was that, it was skin? No. Oral, oral, right, oral cancer. Um, uh, the structural image, here we were interested in the, in, the, in the vascularity, and so this was an animal model, prostate tumor, uh, where this probe uh, was inserted into the tumor uh, at a particular location under ultrasound guidance. So we have two, two technologies here. We have the, the monitoring technology, the OCT, but we need another technology to actually know where to put it. And so you use ultrasound guided OCT, uh, and this monitored the blood supply uh, in the tumor uh, during the delivery of the actual treatment. So the treatment is given, in this case, externally, and we're monitoring uh, the treatment uh, uh, as it proceeds. And I'll just show you this movie. Uh, and just look at the middle panel. So this is before PDT. So here's two blood vessels, uh, actually an artery and a vein. Uh, this is during PDT. And if you watch the middle panel, you will see what happens is that that blood vessel closes down. Both of those blood vessels. So we closed down both the arterial side and the venous side. Now, for this particular treatment, which was a, a, a prostate tumor for photofrin, uh, you'll see that eventually, and the treatment was about 10 minutes, uh, so this is obviously speeded up. Uh, you'll see this changes to after PDT in a moment. You'll notice that we shut down those blood vessels a long time before we stopped the treatment. Uh, after treatment, there's actually a little you see it comes on. There's a little rebound of the vascularity. So you start to see the blood vessel just reappearing and reopening. And so you can look at that blood vessel and, and um, uh, plot out the, uh, uh, the, 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 the blood flow. Uh, and this shows it uh, done in uh, melanoma with two different photosensitizers. So now you ask, okay, so I'm looking at the vascular response of PDT uh, during the treatment. Uh, and so if I use photofrin against melanoma, here is uh, nothing much happens, and then there's a slow shutdown in the vasculature, and then there's a rebound. This, is, this has been shown in animal models by microscopy, uh, 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 not with melanoma, but with other tumors with photofrin, uh, maybe 20 years ago by Will and Starr. Uh, and so photofrin does appear, even if the treatment is curative, does appear to have this vascular rebound phenomenon. <coughs> and it's not fully understood. If we use TUCAD, which is the vascularly targeted agent that we used for, uh, um, in patients, you see that the, uh, the uh, uh, blood uh, flow shuts down extremely quickly, in fact, within a minute. The treatment lasts about 10 minutes. So then you ask the question, what's this light doing? Because this is oxygen dependent, and the first minute of treatment shuts down the vascular system, why don't we just go home and let the patient wake up? And it's not clear what the answer to that is. Is this, is this actually useful light? Is it just because of the place we measured? Maybe the surface stuff is shut down quickly, but you need to wait longer for the deeper uh, tissue to be treated. But anyway, the important point is you can make dynamic measurements during the treatment. And so in principle, if you knew that prostate cancer with TUCAD should respond like this, and you were doing a patient where it wasn't responding, you need to do some additional intervention because you're not going to get an adequate treatment. And this just shows that in this particular case, uh, we looked uh, after the treatment uh, at, the, at the histopathology, uh, measured the percent necrosis, and this is uh, percent necrosis versus uh, the uh, initial rate of shutdown. 
So it, wasn't, it turned out not to be so important that it went from there to there, but how quickly it went from there to there. And if you measure that, it's actually predictive of the necrosis. So in fact, you can now start to think about, well, let's measure these in patients during the treatment, and we then have an idea of whether or not our treatment is going to have worked. And so it's useful as a way of doing online uh, dosimetry, online monitoring uh, of the response. The last thing I'll talk about in PDT, because we haven't covered it, so I thought I would, is two-photon PDT. And the concept here is to use simultaneous absorption of two near-infrared photons in photodynamic activation. So the normal process, simplified for PDT, is the absorption of light in the ground state mo molecule sensitizer up to the singlet state, and then it can de-excite or go across to the triplet state. I'll show you in the next slide. But it's also possible to excite these singlet states by the simultaneous absorption of two longer wavelength photons, each of which is, say, half the energy or double the wavelength. Each one of these photons by themselves would not be enough to get to this level, but the simultaneous absorption of these would get you to that level. This is a nonlinear process where the probability of this process is proportional to the intensity squared, unlike linear one photon PDT where the probability of this is just proportional to the intensity, and that turns out to be important. This process was first described by Maria Gopert Meyer, who won a, no a, Nobel, uh, a Nobel Prize in Physics in 1963 for the description of this phenomenon. So this, era, this field is actually interestingly dotted with Nobel Prizes that are sort of surrounding the field. So why would you do this? Well, this shows the classic uh, uh, example uh, in the literature of, for instance, why you use two-photon uh, uh, microscopy, confocal microscopy, because if you take a, a, linear, a, a, a low intensity laser beam and shine it into a cuvette, this could be a cuvette of a photosensitizer, uh, then you get activation throughout the whole volume. But if you focus the light, the two-photon light, to a point, then only at that point is the intensity of the light high enough to overcome the fact that most photosensitizers have an extremely low uh, uh, cross-section. And so you need a high enough squared intensity to give you uh, the probability of absorption. In principle, this allows you to spatially confine the PDT treatment. Here, if this was in tissue, all of this tissue would be treated. Here, only this focal spot of tissue would be treated. Now, in order to do this, uh, you, can't take the, you cannot take this laser pointer and make it do two photon. Uh, you need extremely short pulses of light uh, of the order of 100 femtoseconds. And the reason for that is that you have to get extremely high intensity. You want the I value to be very big, but you don't want to deliver a lot of energy because you'll just uh, do thermal or mechanical destruction. Uh, and so you want very short pulse laser so that you can have an instantaneous, very high intensity, but without a large pulse energy. And you also need to use a photosensitizer with high two photon absorption, but low one photon absorption, and at wavelengths that have a large penetration in tissue. Uh, does this work? So the first question I'll ask is, uh, if you took uh, photoferrin, or vertiporphyrin, or, or MTHPC, or FOSCAN, whatever, could you do two photon PDT with that? And the answer is yes. Uh, this is uh, illustrated here. These are, this is the absorption uh, spectrum uh, of photoferrin and vertiporphyrin uh, for one photon absorption. So you're familiar with this now. The, there's the, the 630 peak that we normally use for photoferrin PDT. There's the 690 peak that's used for vertiporphyrin PDT. This is the two photon cross section. You notice that it has got different units. And in this case, if you plot, for example, the fluorescence signal, so if we went back to this type of setup and we measured the fluorescence signal, how bright is that fluorescent spot, and we plot that as a function of the excitation intensity, then you would expect that for one photon absorption, that would be the slope of this. This is a log-log plot. So the slope of this should be one because the fluorescence intensity should be proportional uh, to, to the, the fluorescence should be proportional to the intensity, sorry, this one, whereas for two photon PDT, this should be a quadratic, and so the slope of this line should be two, and you can see that it is. So uh, this means that we know that this cross-section that we're measuring here is a two-photon cross-section. 
Does this work in cells? So here's survival curves with Visudine. This is just number of exposures of the, of the, of the laser pulse, and you can see that for different concentrations of dye uh, and different powers, you can get uh, 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 survival curves. And again, you can say, let's take the 50% cell survival, plot that versus the uh, uh, log uh, laser power. And again, you can demonstrate that you do get two photon killing because the slope of this response line is 1.92 plus or minus. So it's consistent with two. So this was actually the first uh, demonstration in cells of, of, of two photon PDT uh, done in, the, in this very numerical way. Now, if you plot these cell survival curves against the light dose, now joules per square centimeter, you get these two curves. And not surprisingly, uh, Visudine is much more effective as a two photon PDT agent than Potofrin. Uh, its cross section is 30 GM units versus seven, so it's four times as, as uh, absorbing at these wavelengths, and you say, well, that's good. Well, let's just use Visudine uh, and do two photon PDT, but then you realize a typical one photon PDT light dose is an order or two orders of magnitude lower. So although you can kill cells in this way, it's extremely inefficient. Uh, you need a lot of en energy. So how would be, uh, um, how can two photon activation be increased? Sorry, that's been cut off. So you've got two options. This is the equation, the probability for two photon goes as a half times the cross section times I squared, so you have two choices. You want to make this probability higher, you can increase the light intensity or you can increase the, uh, the cross section. So let's increase the light intensity. So we just take our femtosecond laser and crank up the power. Okay. <coughs> Does that work? Well, here's a cell layer. So this is a monolayer of endothelial cells before treatment. And if we start giving it uh, treatment with uh, nice big femtosecond laser pulses, um, then over time you see, you just watch this dynamically, and you see the cells starting to die. Because as they die, they start to bleb and they start to lift off the plate. This is not a cell that's blowing up huge, it's just a cell that's lifting off the plate and it's getting out of focus. Uh, but you can see that you can kill these cells. So you say, well, that was good. I would, I'll, just, uh, I'll just take my uh, Visudine. This is done with Visudine. I'll take Visudine, and I'll just get a nice high power femtosecond laser, and I'll just crank up the power. Uh, the problem is that this was done without any photosensitizer. <laughs> so this is actually not PDT. This is photomechanical damage the same way as if you go up that curve that I showed you earlier of, of, of uh, power density versus time. So this strategy does not work. And it turns out that for these photosensitizers, you cannot get reasonable cell kill by increasing the light intensity. So there's nothing left for it but to go for this one. Now it turns out that's very difficult and you need to then get chemists involved. <coughs> and so a number of groups, uh, and we've worked with a couple of groups, one from Montana and one from Oxford in England, uh, have developed uh, uh, photosensitizers that are designed specifically for two photon PDT. Uh, really, none of the one photon PDT agents are going to work. So you need to specifically design it. I don't understand the photophysics of this. It's very complicated to understand why if you take a porphyrin dimer, which is what this one is, uh, and, you and you have the two, di the, the two porphyrin molecules linked in a very special way, you can get a huge increase in the two-photon cross-section. But anyway, this drug, which was developed by ha uh, Harry Anderson in chemistry at University of Oxford, has a, uh, has a two-photon cross-section of about 5,000. That's about 100 times higher than the best one-photon cross-section. And it really does kill cells, and it kills cells by the two-photon effect, as you see by the uh, quadratic dependence on power. And so that looks uh, very encouraging. Uh, and we did proof of principle studies. We were interested in doing this to shut down individual blood vessels. And so this is this window chamber model. And we essentially target the laser light onto just a spot in this blood vessel. Here's another blood vessel running alongside. And you can see we can selectively shut down this blood vessel with no damage to this blood vessel. So it goes to the point of extreme precision. So this is diffraction limited PDT. Uh, targeting. 
And you can study the molecular uh, uh, aspects of this. So this is just uh, lots of different uh, molecular staining uh, to try to understand are we killing the endothelial cells and by what mechanism of death are we killing them? And you can look uh, uh, dynamically at what actually happens to the blood vessel. So this is a case where this blood vessel was touched there with PDT and this one here. And these, after, after the treatment, uh, platelets that were uh, uh, labeled with a photosensitizer were injected into the animal. And you see what happens is that the platelets are essentially getting trapped here and here. So these blood vessels are being cut, are being shut down by thrombosis. Okay, so they're still actually open, uh, but the endothelial cells have been killed, so the basement membrane is exposed, and so the platelets stick to it, and they cause a thrombosis. So we understand quite a lot about the biology of, of how this works. Why would we do this? Well, the potential application was to treat age-related macular degeneration, which is this uh, uh, cause of blindness uh, in the elderly that cuts out central vision and is caused by the growth of blood vessels into uh, the, the, the choroidal retinal uh, layers. And photodynamic therapy, in fact, became the treatment of choice uh, for this condition. Um, why would we use two photon? Well, if you now think about the cross section of the retina, uh, so here's this blood vessel growing up into the, the, the retinal space. If you do one photon PDT, you focus the light onto what you think is the abnormal vasculature, but if there's drug anywhere else in this tissue, and of course those blood vessels are leaky, and therefore the drug is going to leak out, you will actually treat all of, those, all of that tissue. And in fact, one of the characteristics of uh, uh, Visudyne PDT for macular degeneration is that you need to give multiple treatments because it's thought that what's happening is that this damage, un this collateral damage that's not intended, you just want to shut down the blood vessels, you don't want to damage the rest of this tissue, uh, causes uh, hypoxia, which upregulates angiogenesis, which is actually the exact opposite of what you want to do. <laughs> And so you need to give multiple treatments. And so the idea of two photon PDT is let's just target the vessel. So only the blood vessel would be treated. Uh, the idea would be to do this through a laser scanning confocal ophthalmoscope, which is the ophthalmic equivalent of a, of a, of a confocal microscope. And this just shows an example. This is actually a femtosecond uh, imaging uh, through a laser confocal ophthalmoscope in our lab, and it works well. So you can imagine, this is an normal uh, uh, volunteer, but you can imagine if there's an area of macular degeneration here, then we could uh, switch the femtosecond laser onto treatment power and be able to then uh, target. And so the idea would be if you had a patch of AMD here, then you could either do a, uh, and you, the ophthalmologist would outline that on the computer, and would then, we'd then set up the therapeutic beam to scan across that and shut it down. The other possibility is that some of these lesions have so-called feeder vessels, and so they're blood vessels that feed this whole patch of neovascularization, so you could target the feeder vessels. So that's the state of this is that we've done the preclinical studies. Uh, we have not yet moved into the clinic, but it's an interesting possibility. The other option for 2 photon PDT is that there is a report uh, from the Montana group in clinical cancer research a few years ago in which they treated a tumor using their 2 photon uh, agent actually through two centimeters of tissue. So they had a mouse with a tumor on one side and they treated from the other side. That would never work with 1 photon PDT and yet they reported uh, apparently good tumor response. The mechanisms for this, what is happening here is not fully understood. And in fact, there's a project running at the moment to try to really understand, is this a genuine result? And if so, if this is true, if this is really two photon PDT, then we don't understand the physics of light propagation in tissue. And that'll be good because that'll give us another 20 years of research uh, to, to try to understand. I have my suspicions that that's not the reason that this works, but I'll discuss that offline. So let me come to the third thing, which is optical guidance for interventions. So this is a little table. This is, we have a paper coming out on this, and I can let anyone have a copy. It's just a sort of uh, a thinking paper about this. So here's lots of interventions. There's lots of different therapeutic interventions, surgery, radiotherapy, chemo, lots of biophysical therapies, biotherapies. And if we think about how could we use optical guidance to help 
deliver these interventions better. We can think about spectroscopy, we can think about imaging, spectral imaging, using endogenous signals, endogenous signals, fluorescence, Raman, blah, 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 blah. So what are the interesting parts of this table that would be worth exploring? And we want to explore it both pre-treatment, before the intervention, so that we can plan the treatment, during the treatment, so that we can guide and modulate the treatment, and post-treatment to try and analyze. And this really is in the context of personalized medicine to try to uh, make tailor these treatments to the medicine, to the patient. So start with surgery. Uh, what are the unmet needs in surgery? This is tumor surgery in particular, so for other surgery you have to think in, in maybe different ways. But for example, the unmet need in tumor surgery is to extend the surgeon's vision so that any residual tumor near the end of surgery can be removed if it's safe to do so. And then you reduce the risk of local recurrence or metastasis and reduce the need for second surgery. So in principle, that's what you're doing. And there's lots of optical options and applications. The one that I'll, and so this is just a, a summary table. If you look at surgery, say tumor surgery before, during, and after, here's just a list, and it's not supposed to be a, a complete list, but of the sorts of things that you could think about using optical monitoring for. So you could think about defining the tumor margins, co-registering with the radiological volume, localizing critical adjacent structures, determining the optimal surgical approach, guide biopsy to confirm and stage the tumor, uh, during the surgery, identify and localize residual mesoscopic tumor, uh, identify the tumor margin depth in resection specimens and post. You could use it to assess healing and viability and Colin this morning showed you that this is, just because you finish the surgery doesn't mean that you're no longer responsible for the patient. The, the, the post-surgical uh, follow-up is very important. So the example I'll take, because it's the one we've worked on most, is fluorescence guidance in brain tumor surgery. So here's a brain tumor. We know that these are very fatal uh, tumors. The tumor patients die almost always locally. So here we're looking down into the resection cavity after the surgeon has completely removed the tumor, as far as he can tell. If you look in fluorescence, that's tumor. The red stuff is tumor that is not visible to the surgeon. So this is not because the surgeon is not competent or needs new glasses. You can't see the tumor. We have not evolved visual systems that allow us to see tumors. There's no Darwinian process <laughs> to be able to see tumors. Uh, so no one should be ashamed of the fact that they can't see the tumor. Uh, so uh, we've worked on this for 10 years now and, and we've gone through various generations of technology. Like any technology, it has to mature. So we started off with this huge technology it was reduced to this much smaller uh, system and w that became uh, ne nearly real time. We were not quite real time. This is, this is in the prostate, during prostate surgery. And we've now got this down to a, uh, a handheld system that's based on a cell phone and I'll come back to that a little later. Uh, the idea of fluorescence guided surgery has moved into the clinic, in Europe in particular. Uh, the Zeiss have incorporated fluorescence into the microscope. It uses ALA. And here is after surgery, you see uh, the blue light, the scattered, but there's still some residual tumor here because as the surgeon sucks away uh, with, with the uh, suction, uh, you start to see the tumor that was left behind. And clearly this should be removed if it's safe to do so. And the German group uh, in a multi-center trial showed significant survival advantage. Although this is very nice, uh, the limitations from a technical point of view are that it's subjective. The surgeon has to sort of look at the fluorescence and say, is that bright or not bright? And of course, it's qualitative and it's surface detection only. This issue of subjectivity in surgical guidance is an important one, in particular for fluorescence. Uh, these are nine phantoms, so just simple gels with uh, photofrem, or sorry, with PP9 and you look at the fluorescence. Each of these has the same concentration of PP9. So if you want to identify tumor based on PP9, you're gonna to have to deal with this problem. And the reason that they look so different is that they have different absorption and scattering. So you somehow, as we've touched on earlier, need to be able to, and Bruce touched on this, deal with the, option, uh, the uh, uh, scattering 
and, and absorption of the tissue. So we, for example, built a probe device. Uh, this video just shows this in use during brain tumor surgery. At the end of surgery, uh, there was nothing left. In fact, there wasn't even any visual fluorescence left in this case. You come in with this little fiber point, you see a flash of white light, uh, it measures both the fluorescence spectrum and the reflectance spectrum, and we use a reflectance spectrum in the technique that Tim talked about this morning uh, to extract the absorption spectrum, the scattering spectrum, and then we apply that to correct the measurement. And we're able to show not only does this significantly increase the accuracy for high-grade glioma, but also extend it into low-grade glioma, which was previously unaccessible. Of course, uh, our, our surgeon friends are never satisfied. They say, well, that's great. Uh, now we want an imaging version of that, please. <laughs> uh, can you make a quantitative imaging system? And that's much more difficult, much, much more difficult. And, and there's three or four different possible approaches to this. I'll just show you a couple that we're working on. One is hyperspectral fluorescence. They say, well, why don't you just do the same thing? You, so you measure the fluorescence spectrum and the reflectance spectrum at the point. Why don't you just make an image? Uh, a, a fluorescent spectral image and a, and a reflectance image. And now the technology is such that you can do that. The problem is it comes down to how you analyze the data. Because if I have a light uh, illuminating the whole of the surface and I make a measurement pixel by pixel, the signal from each pixel is not independent of the light uh, and the tissue optical properties around it. Uh, so it's not so easy to do that. This is a semi-empirical way to do it. Uh, that uh, uh, seems to work reasonably well. So this is a quantitative fluorescence image. So the surgeon can actually know how much PP9 is there. And in principle, you would build up a data set from clinical trials that shows you the probability of tumor versus the concentration of PP9. And now the surgeon says, okay, I'm at this point in the surgery. I'm pretty close to a critical structure. Ah, the PP9 concentration tells me that I've got a 65% probability that this tissue is malignant let me decide whether or not to resect. Uh, so you're putting that capability into the hands of the sur surgeon. It's not to replace the decision making, it's to enable the decision making by the surgeon based on objective uh, evidence. And Bruce showed you uh, yesterday uh, the other possibility that we're working on uh, uh, is to combine with spatial light modulation, which gives you the 3D distribution of the optical absorption and the scattering, use it to correct the fluorescence image and to calculate the PP9 concentration, both the distribution and also, importantly, the depth. So you can principle, even if there is normal brain overlying some residual tumor, you would be able to see, ah, there's still tumor there. Let me decide whether or not to keep resecting. Another example uh, in surgery is the added value of co-registering optical and non-optical. And this is an example from some work uh, in our lab where we're merging real and virtual endoscopy, in this case for skull-based uh, surgery. Uh, and so, if I start this video, um, what you see here are the pretreatment radiological images. Uh, and here you see the real, t so this, I these images are taken before treatment, the, the grayscale images before treatment, so the surgeon has decided where to try to cut, where to approach the, the, the skull base from. And here is the actual procedure happening. Uh, uh, through uh, endoscopic uh, uh, visualization. And what the surgeon really wants to know now is where am I? Uh, I, I can see where I am in the endoscope, but where is that uh, uh, with respect to the radiological image on which I did the, the, the surgical planning? And so we've been able to do co-registration, real-time co-registration between the real endoscopic image and if you like the virtual endoscopic image. So from these CT scans or MR scans, it doesn't matter which, uh, you can reconstruct uh, the virtual image that corresponds and helps guide the real image. And so that's in, in, this is actually, this is in a cadaver, uh, but it's about to move into, into uh, real patients. So surgery, what about other mainstream areas of cancer treatment? Well, radiation therapy. How could we use optics to help in radiation therapy? Uh, Preclinical, uh, pre-treatment, you can imagine, just as in surgery, you can use it to plan, to, to identify where you should be, where you should be pointing your beams. During treatment, you could think about tracking changes in the tumor extent uh, or to monitor radiation beam delivery. 
and afterwards you would use it to track cellular or vascular changes and to try to understand how that correlates with the treatment and maybe how it's modulated by chemotherapy. So here's an example, uh, similar to the surgical example that I just gave you, but this time co-registering uh, uh, the real and virtual endoscopic images from the perspective of radiation planning. So just as the surgeon does planning beforehand and wants to see what's happening uh, during the surgery, so in radiotherapy, uh, you can, this, the radiotherapist normally does the planning based on these virtual images, uh, but now you can combine this with the real images, the real endoscopic images, because now you think, oh, well, I could use a fluorescent molecular target there, which would help me really identify the true biological margins of the tumor. And so rather than treating just by the anatomy, you can treat by the biology, so the molecular or the functional biology. And now you can use this, merge it in the same way, and now the radiation oncologist can target, can design his treatment plan based on whatever information, molecular or functional information you get from the endoscopic images. But you have to do very precise co-registration of these images, which is actually technically very non-trivial and quite an interesting problem, both from the engineering point of view, but also from the mathematical point of view. Another very interesting recent development in radiation has been this development that's been pioneered by Brian Pogue, uh, which is to use Cherenkov radiation to actually delineate the treatment fields. Now, you may remember from school physics, I don't know if this was taught in the schools, I can't remember when I first heard about Cherenkov, uh, but uh, Cherenkov radiation is light given off when a charged particle travels through a medium faster than the speed of light in that medium. So if you have electrons whizzing along uh, through water, for example, and this is looking down into a reactor, if you've ever visited a nuclear reactor, you see this blue glow. It's really neat. That's a Cherenkov radiation. That's because the uh, particles uh, are actually generating the light, and you can look at the physics of that. It doesn't matter for our purposes here. Uh, but if it works here, if it works in a reactor, why wouldn't it work in tissue? And so here's an example of a phantom, it's not a real patient yet, but of a brain phantom uh, with a radiotherapy beam going through it and looking at the Cherenkov radiation. So you can visualize the radiotherapy beam. Uh, that's fantastic. Uh, radiotherapy planning has been done blind. Uh, treatment setup in radiotherapy is largely done blind, but with, with guidance. Uh, and so uh, the, the Dartmouth group have done a number of studies and phantoms, as you would expect. And this, uh, the, what I'm about to show you is for square beams and for this so-called Tetris-shaped beam. You know, radiation treatment is quite complex now because you use intensity modulation. And this is examples of the Cherenkov images. And you can make movies of them so you can go in three dimensions. Uh, the Cherenkov images of uh, a square beam going through a phantom and a treacherous shift beam. And you can see it actually works very well. So now you could think about having a, a camera, a reasonably sensitive camera, looking at the Cherenkov radiation from the patient during the treatment so you're actually able to monitor for the first time the radiation beam going through the patient. So I think this is a very important advance. The other possibility is to say, well, let's under use optical imaging to uh, monitor the biological response. And this is some work, again, from uh, Ralph de Costa in our institution, uh, where in an animal model, you can show there's lots of interesting things that you can measure using these optical techniques. And for example, you can look at, uh, this is uh, uh, images uh, after radiotherapy. This is a single large dose of radiotherapy. The tumor cells are in red. You see this, treat this dose has not had too much effect on the tumor, but it's had enormous effect on the vasculature. Uh, but if you look at this image, which is fluorescence image, this is flore this, these images on the top are green fluorescent dye injected. The images on the bottom are so-called speckle variance OCT, which does not depend on the presence of the dye. Uh, uh, in fact, this shows you that even although it looks as if you have complete shutdown of the vascular flow here, there's no blood flow here, the, the fluorescent dye is not getting there, these vessels are still open. So it tells you something about the biology of what's going on here, and there's increasing uh, appreciation that the actual outcome of tumor response to radiotherapy is not just to do with killing the tumor cells. A lot is to do with also how the treatment affects the vasculature. Uh, 
And here's another example, and, and, and uh, there was a poster from Bahar uh, uh, a couple of days ago uh, using OCT, again, Doppler OCT, to show that you can actually monitor uh, the effects of, uh, of uh, radiation uh, on uh, 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 tissue. And this is, in fact, this human oral tissue. So it would be interestingly complementary, I think, Colin, to your structural. So we haven't really looked much at the structural thing. Uh, but you see here there's something funny about the, va the, vascular, uh, the vasculature here post-radiation. Uh, it, the, the, there's much higher blood flow here, uh, there's much more turbulent flow. So this is probably a, a vasodilation effect, and so the question is, what does that end up with in terms of the biological response? Chemo, well, Bruce already uh, uh, showed you this morning uh, that uh, during treatment, you can use it to track the changes in the status of the tumor so that you can modify the drug treatment. You could also think about m monitoring drug uptake in tumor. Uh, not many chemotherapeutic drugs are fluorescent, but they're all Raman active because they're all organic drugs. So you could think about using Raman to monitor drug uptake in tumors. Uh, and of course, beforehand, you could determine tumor metabolic status. And this, like the, like the uh, work that <coughs> Bruce showed you this morning, uh, these are optical tomo tomographs. This is from uh, uh, Dartmouth uh, lab uh, in two patients. Uh, so this is just the normal radiological images. Here's the optical image. They look terrible. Uh, you, you, could, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't use that for diagnosis, but that's not the point. Uh, you know that the patient has a tumor there. What you're interested in is does that tumor change with treatment? And in this patient, clearly the tumor is changing with chemotherapy. So something's happening. In this patient, nothing's happening. In fact, it might even be getting worse. Uh, by, by this. And in fact, if you then plot out, uh, these are individual patients, uh, you really can show that this optical technique, terrible resolution, but great functional information, uh, is actually able to predict whether or not this patient is responsive to chemotherapy. And if you think about the cost, both financial and in terms of patient stress of chemotherapy, it's really important to find out that this drug does not work with my tumor. PDT, of course, as you would expect, there's an optical, we're talking about optical monitoring of an optical therapy, and so there's lots and lots of possibilities, both before treatment, during the treatment, and after treatment. This could be, again, a lecture in itself. I won't go into it because we've dealt with that a lot. But I wanted to show you a couple of other examples, um, <coughs> and this is, uh, can I have five minutes? Okay. Uh, uh, I, I call this mechanical therapy. And this is not tumor, but this is uh, cardiovascular. And I show it because it's so spectacular. Uh, and so uh, what you're looking at here is an OCT image, an intravascular OCT image. This is from Brett Bruma and Gary at Mass General Hospital. So you're looking inside the coronary artery. And uh, these are OCT images, structural images, the same as Colin showed you this morning, the black and white structural images. But the texture of the tissue at every point has been analyzed. So you see that speckly gray stuff? You can analyze that. And in fact, they've shown that it's possible to then uh, classify. So these yellow areas here are actually lipid, not because of biochemical uh, 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 measurement, because of the t texture allows you to see that. And we're going to fly through this blood vessel. This is an alive patient, and we're flying through the blood vessel. This gray line is the guide wire uh, along which the OCT goes. You see these yellow and green areas. Uh, white areas are areas of calcification, calcium deposit. Um, anyone like to guess what the blue is? Colin probably knows, maybe? No, it's not atheroma, interesting. Uh, so look at it in more detail. It has a slight regular structure. Looks t it's a stent, right? So this is a patient who has had, you just failed your cardiovascular exam. <laughs> this, this, yeah, you can. Uh, uh, so this is a patient who previously had a stent. So a stent is a metal wire uh, like, like a mesh that's put in and expanded to hold the blood vessel uh, open. Nowadays, these are often coated with a drug to, to, to help uh, 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 stop the uh, uh, reclosing. Uh, this stent is breaking down. You see, it's all bits and pieces of stent. It's not a continuous stent. And so this was used to assess the stent and then 
during the same procedure, they then put a new stent in over the top. Uh, this uh, was done by essentially pulling back uh, uh, through the blood vessel. Um, this took four seconds to make the measurements. It took four hours to do the computer reconstruction. Right? So for those of you who are in computer science, if you want to make a contribution, you have to find some way of analyzing the texture of OCT images 10,000 times faster. So that's the unmet need. That's the unmet technical need. We need 10,000, a 10 to the 4 speed up of the image processing. If you can achieve that, this is fantastic. Four hours later, nobody's interested. The, pa this, you know, the patient's gone home. Uh, another example from a completely different area is what we call decontamination monitoring. <coughs> so this is from, from our lab, uh, where we're interested in um, imaging bacteria by their fluorescence. And in particular, this is used for, for monitoring uh, chronic diabetic wounds. So this is a patient, uh, cr patients with uh, 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 diabetes often have poor blood flow in the limbs and develop these ulcers on pressure points which become infected, and this is a nightmare to deal with. So we used, we developed this uh, uh, fluorescence camera based on a cell phone, it's like an ordinary commercial cell phone, couple of LEDs, some filters, which are slightly special, but not fantastically special, and you can image the bacteria. And so this is it, you, this, this is it being used, it's called Prodigy, uh, in the clinic. Uh, and the point about this is that um, it allows you to immediately decide whether or not you have residual bacteria, because what happens here is that the physician or the nurse uh, uh, tries to clean up these wounds on each visit, but of course it's unable to see the bacteria. So they have to take a swab and then they get the report back three days later. So this gives you the possibility to do real-time monitoring uh, of, um, uh, of, of contamination uh, so that the patient can be properly cleaned up uh, because it looks as if what's really happening here is that one of the reasons that these patients don't heal is that they never get clean. Uh, so they, they come in and they think they've cleaned them up and they put a new bandage on, but all you've done is given the bugs a nice new environment to live in, okay, and a nice clean bandage to, to, to invade. And so it looks as if, uh, I don't have time to go into the details, but this does actually make a difference, and this, this system is in clinical trials in the hands of district nurses. So again, you could think about this used in Africa. You know, s everyone in Africa has cell phones. Not too difficult to make a method to measure infection using your cell phone. And so uh, uh, hopefully this will be an important technology. I want to end with photothermal therapy, where rather than where we're in the thermal region, and again, pre-treatment, pre during treatment, post-treatment, and I want to end with this just to uh, uh, show you something that we're very excited about just of the, as of the last few weeks. <coughs> so we've been doing a clinical trial to treat focal prostate cancer. So unlike the PDT that Tim described, for example, here we're not trying to treat the whole tumor, uh, the whole prostate. This is men uh, with low or intermediate risk disease who have uh, focal lesion that's within the prostate uh, and who at the moment either have to have no treatment or some radical treatment such as prostatectomy surgery or radiotherapy and that r has a great risk of, of, uh, of, of bad side effects of impotence or incontinence. And so this is, uh, uh, we have this platform now up and running. We've done about 50 or 60 patients. Um, at the moment, we are this is all done within the MRI unit. Uh, used, uh, we use a robot, an MRI compatible robot that was developed in our lab to actually put the optical fibers into the prostate. And we use MR imaging to actually monitor the treatment because you actually, you, you know, you do have to monitor what's happening here because if you just keep giving the infrared light, you'll eventually burn your way through the patient. Uh, and so we use uh, MR thermometry, and you see here, this is a prostate, sorry, it's very small, but you use MR thermometry in near real time to actually image the temperature. And so you can decide, is the treatment complete? Uh, and you can then develop all the software uh, for displaying what's going on, uh, and, and this is also very important. The surgeon has to understand in 3D 
what is happening here. So you need to provide them with the tools and that red stuff is the, the zone of, 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 of increased temperature and you have to make sure that, that covers uh, the, the, the target tumor. Uh, however, uh, there are disadvantages for using MRI for this. Uh, it's expensive, it's cumbersome. I mean, our MRI unit is a big machine. It has limited accuracy, and, and because it's expensive and cumbersome, it limits dissemination. So you're not going to do this in Africa or in isolated areas of Brazil or even very far from Toronto. <laughs> it's just not realistic. And so what we've been looking at is can we make this realistic and it comes back to the lecture that I gave at the beginning, which is to use uh, these porphyrin nanoparticles. So those of you who do not have Alzheimer's will remember uh, these porphyrin uh, uh, porphyrin nanoparticles, and we combine this with transrectal uh, oh, uh, photoacoustic imaging. Uh, uh, that's interesting. Uh, how are we going to use this? Well, we um, uh, realized. Uh, this was really just a couple of months ago, uh, and I was tellin telling a uh, group at lunchtime that this, this, uh, this uh, breakthrough actually came because we were writing a grant and therefore had to think deeply about the problem. So uh, we're making these porphosomes uh, out of a different uh, photosensitizer, a different porphyrin. In fact, it's TUCAD. It's bacteria chlorin. We're not using this for PDT, so it doesn't matter uh, that it's the same molecule. But it turns out that um, because um, uh, bacterial chlorophyll or bacterial chlorine is derived from bacteria, uh, it actually has um, light harvesting capability. And in order to harvest light efficiently for photos photosynthesis, uh, you, the uh, porphyrin molecules are arranged in a so-called J aggregate. The details of that don't matter, but it's a special arrangement of the porphyrin molecules. It's not just a standard arrangement. And it turns out that if you have these particular porphyrins in the lipid of the, of the porphosome, and you heat up the porphosome, at, at low temperature, you have a photoacoustic signal. The main absorption is at 825 nanometers. As you heat up the nanoparticle, it actually shifts. So this is a, a function of temperature. So this peak goes away and this peak appears. And this is because as you heat up the nanoparticle, the lipid becomes more fluid. It's not disintegrating, it just becomes more fluid and the aggregates are able to, re, uh, to go into different conformation and they spectrally shift. Now you say, wow, here is a way of measuring temperature. If that happens, any phenomenon that's temperature dependent, you can use as a thermometer. And so we very recently, and th these data are like a week old, uh, have done a first proof of principle experiment of this. And this is my last slide, uh, sorry, second last slide, uh, where we've just taken a phantom. There's a couple of tubes here with gel and porphosomes in them. Uh, and it's just on the heating bed. This is a thermal picture, a thermal camera picture. And this is the image so the heat is coming from the bottom. This is the 824 image. So remember when it's at the original temperature and this is the 750. And you notice what happens here is that as it heats up, this moves up and away because the, this signal is lost and this signal is appearing. And so we think that we are able to use a transrectal photoacoustic probe, give the patient these J-porphosomes and have a means of non-invasively monitoring the temperature that we can then use to control the photothermal treatment. And so now you have a technology that could be disseminated. You can get this out of the MRI. You can get this into the hands of the, of the uh, urological surgeon uh, out in the more remote areas. So we're very excited about that. So just to summarize, there's lots of technology components here. We, each of us have different skills in bringing together hardware, software, wetware, bioware. So we need the engineers, we need the software people, we need the chemists, we need the biologists to develop the technology components. But the technology components themselves do nothing. One of the challenges of taking these technology components into clinical translation, and I'm thinking on a high level here, not an individual technology level, but whatever technology you're talking about, what do you have to do? Well, the first thing you have to do is integrate. Right? You have to integrate 
these technologies into some sort of technology platform that can go into the hands of the surgeon or into the hands of the nurse or into the hands of the, uh, of the uh, medical person in a village in Africa. Integrating is not by itself enough. So, for instance, when we built our first fluorescence camera for brain, we did a lovely job of integration. We then took it to a company to see if we, they would be interested to, to make it with us, and they said, that's a beautiful piece of technology. It is unmanufacturable. What do you mean? There's no such word. We just made that up. They said, sorry, that is unmanufactured. You can make that in a lab one-off. You could not make that in a company at a price that you could sell. So it's unmanufactured, it's effectively unmanufacturable. So as well as integration, it has to be ergonomic. I don't know if you can read it, it says, no wonder your arm aches, shackles should be placed at eye level. It's an, econom it's an ergonomic nightmare down here. So it tells you that you have to integrate, but you have to, the system has to be ergonomic, it has to be practical, it has to be realistic for its intended use. And finally, it has to be cost effective. This says in a bank, we're not doing cash transactions anymore, so research has shown that they're not cost effective. And we know that from banks. You can hardly do a cash transaction at banks because they're not cost effective. So if you want to take your technologies from the lab, translate them into the clinic, you have to integrate, they have to be ergonomic, and they have to be cost effective. If you get to that point, then you have a technology solution that has the potential to impact medicine. So with that thought, Thank you, it's been a real pleasure to be here. Brian, I have two questions on the two photon PDT. The two photons PDT, when you have a two photons transition, uh, there are two things that are important. You have intensity or you have a phase between photons. When we have a turbid medium, we may have intensity, but not phase. So when you have a layer of cells, I can understand that that's easy to fulfill the phase requirement. But we, when you are in the diffused medium, that may be a problem. So you may have intensity, but you may not have a phase. So the two photon transition will go down. That, that's a very interesting thought. Um, I, to my knowledge, no one has looked at that in tissue. We, we have a, we have, we're just setting up an experiment, actually it's being set up in a lab in Florida to actually try to do autocorrelation studies of two photons in tissue uh, for, for, for that sort of reason. And the reason that that's really, the, the, the reason that that's being driven is that we just don't understand the experiments of Spangler. How can you treat through two centimeters of tissue? It doesn't make any, I mean, anyone who does confocal microscopy said that's impossible. So maybe there's some funny phase effects, I don't know. Uh, but we'll find out. And the second question is concerning the shift on the bacterial chlorine when you have temperature. So when we use light, the molecular temperature may not be the environmental temperature. We need a thermalization, right? So I can heat up a, a molecule and still it's very hot, have a big shift, but the overall temperature is low. So my question is, how can you identify molecular temperature from overall tissue temperature in this case? Or maybe that doesn't matter because you're gonna use to identify something. So this is not molecular temperature. Uh, sorry, I had to go through this very quickly. Uh, if you take the, uh, the, the, the porphyrin and uh, measure the spectrum and heat it up, you do not see this, this shift. Uh, this shift beca comes because of a conformational change of an aggregate of molecules. So it's just like if you take a porphyrin and you, uh, uh, in, in a monomeric state and measure the spectrum and take the porphyrin, and the same porphyrin in an aggregated state, you get a spectral shift. So the spectral shift is not because of the molecular temperature, it's because of a change in the conformation of the aggregate. 
Uh, a bit more specific. You, so you, when you talk about quantitative fluorescence imaging to correct for optic property, you should a formula that is by div divide the fluorescent signal to exciting signal I, and emission reflecting signal with the power of A. How do you get to these equations? Is that uh, a, a mathematic model that uh, can explain or is it all empirical? It's, it's, it's empirical. Uh, so, so, uh, so, I, so uh, the, the short answer to your question, Tim, is that uh, you've got two choices here. Uh, you, c you can do it empirically, uh, you can do a, a quick and dirty empirical, or you can try to do it rigorously. Uh, we are actually are in the middle of trying to do it rigorously because we believe that that's ultimately the correct way to do it. Uh, but we also wanted to quickly get to the clinic so that with the neurosurgeon we could get some real uh, human pictures with the hyperspectral system. Once we got those images, let's just play around with them and see if we see if we can get a, a semi-empirical. It's not entirely empirical; it's semi-empirical. Uh, uh, it, it it seems to work, uh, but of course, the danger of any empirical algorithm is that it only works within the limited range of conditions in which it is validated. <laughs> Uh, whereas if you make a rigorous algorithm, it should work uh, 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 for a much larger range of parameters. So this is a purely stopgap. Uh, but, but I do think, um, and again, as a general message here, I do think if you're developing a technology that you intend ultimately to be clinical, I think it's very important to quickly get something into the hands of the end user. Because you can spend many years trying to optimize something in the lab, and you go to the clinic, and the clinical person says, well, that's not what I wanted, <laughs> or that's useless, that's too big, or that's too small, or that's not, you know. Uh, and so I think, you, I think even before you're ready scientifically, it's worth taking whatever you can cobble together as a prototype into the clinic. It has to have a, a, a collaborator who is tolerant of imperfection. Uh, so you have to work with the right person, but get some clinical data and see what, see what it looks like. And then you have a lot more information that's going to guide you towards the final solution. So we did that. It actually worked surprisingly, it actually worked better than we thought, but we realized that it has limitations that we are now going to try to address. The surgeon actually wants to start using it. And, that, and in fact, there's no reason why he shouldn't because it's better than what he had before. So do it in stages. Don't try, to, don't try to solve the problem completely in one shot because you're doomed to failure if you do that. Thanks. Okay. Let's thank again, Professor.